Rob Braff would be one of the most recognised faces in Australian television. I met Rob many years ago and was struck by his humility, compassion, along with his sense of humour. I recently caught up with Rob to gain an insight into his life, what inspires him and how he deals with some very tough times. Rob would be one of the most inspiring and humble people I have ever met and I hope you enjoy his story. Hello, I'm Rosanna Natoli. I've worked alongside Rob Bruff for more than 20 years. He brings a wealth of experience to the news team but he offers so much more. It's his vast knowledge of regional Queensland, his understanding of humanity, his compassion, humility and his wisdom that sets him apart as a broadcaster and as a leader in his field. Rob, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you. And we go back a long time, but um, I think it was the late 90s when I first met you. Yeah, up in Mackay. It's quite a while ago now, isn't it? Uh, time flies, but uh, my goodness, that was uh, the early days of my working on Seven, yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah. So, Rob, you would have to be one of Australia's longest serving news readers. And I think you record seven news bulletins across Queensland and record 30 updates a day. Is that right? Yeah, we do seven bulletins. Uh, we go live in one, depending on you know where the major stories are, whether it's a late breaking story, but primarily we'll go live on the Sunshine Coast uh, and we record the other ones, you know, as the news becomes available uh, digitally now, of course, you can put it all together and it ends up in Sydney and then at six o'clock, bang, it fires out to seven different markets. Wow. So you must be incredibly busy. What does a day, in the day of, life, in the day of Rob Bruff, what does a day look like? Oh, look, the days are pretty good. I have the mornings, you know, which is great. Um, the afternoons are pretty hectic because once we start, you know, recording updates, um, it's full on. We're in the studio, you know, for about five hours. Um, and of course, things can change. You know, you might do a story about, you know, a court case evolving or whatever, and then very late in the day, uh, there may be a verdict or something might change, or there may be a new lead story. So we may have recorded what we thought was going to be, you know, the news, and then we have to go and redo headlines or uh, redo a first story or whatever, you know, depending on what's happened late. So some days are pretty smooth, you know, it works as it's been formatted and as the, um, you know, as we've sorted out the news bulletins, but then other days it can be quite chaotic, you know, right up till six, you know, and then you're going live. There must be um, a little bit of confusion sometimes when things are changing so much and um, it must be really hard on the producers as well and the directors, I guess. A absolutely. I mean, you're timing everything out. You know, that's the other tricky issue. You know, you've already recorded sport, you've done your weather, Olivia's done his weather, and, you know, then you're putting everything together and, and you're reminding yourself of where you are and, you know, uh, it, it may be raining in one area, it may be fine and sunny in another area. You know, people are dealing with, with different issues, uh, with different weather patterns, depending on where we are. So being aware, you know, of where the news is coming from is very important, yeah. Rob, um, while I was reading, about, you know, doing my research about you, I read about um, back, oh, it was a long time ago, I think, when the Dairy Farmers Stadium opened in Townsville and um, they, they put um, dairy cows behind you thinking it was a story about dairy cows not the, the, not the footy stadium. <laughs> yeah, that can happen. Yeah, we had some uh, strange ones over the years, but uh, uh, you know that's that's TV. You know, people uh, can get confused from time to time. Yeah. Yeah. No, that would have been very funny, I imagine. Um, Rob, when I met you back in the late nineties, I was struck by your compassion, and I imagine that must have stemmed from your childhood. So would you tell me a little bit, bit about your childhood and about your dad, because he suffered polio, didn't he? Yeah, dad had polio when he was about four, very healthy young boy, and then he spent oh, close to five years in hospital, in and out of hospitals, but uh, then at Montrose home. And 
you know, when you talk to him about it, it's quite extraordinary because they can only visit, his mum and dad can only visit on a Sunday. Uh, and he said on a Sunday afternoon, you know, you'd be sitting on your bed waiting for the doors to open for your family to come and, and visit. And this was once a week, so you're a little boy. And that's the only visitation you had. And um, I remember him telling me when he got out of hospital and he got into his dad's truck and they're driving, you know, down the road home. And it was like a new world because he was four or five, six, seven, and he hadn't seen this world. You know, he'd been in hospital for year after year after year. And I understand on, a new, on numerous occasions, you know, the doctors said to his mum and dad, you know, it's all over, you know, you're going to lose him, but he hung on. And he tells some great stories of being in hospital, but I just can't imagine what it must have been like for a young boy spending so many years in hospital and then being exposed to this, you know, this wide world all of a sudden being at home. You know, the joy he talks about, and he's not with us anymore, he died in 92, but the joy he talked about of coming home, uh, you know, I, I don't know, it's something about it sends a shiver down my spine, but he was tough. Um, really tough. Uh, the, the, the lasting memory is that never ever did he ask why me, never ever did he say I can't do something, in fact you didn't dare tell him he couldn't do something um, and and he had a heck of a life. I mean he, uh, he worked out on stations you know all over Queensland riding horses. Horses were a great means for him to get around uh, I remember him telling me about riding a fixed wheel bike, you know, where the bike just keeps going around with one leg. You know, he'd live at, they lived at Richlands in an old humpy, you know, he'd, one leg he'd ride this fixed wheel bike down to the Darra station and then, you know, catch a, a train into work and back home until he got his horses. But it's a remarkable story and just, you know, that sense of never giving up, uh, never accepting you couldn't do something. Even when he had nothing, I can remember him, you know, on his backside with a long-handed shovel, digging up, um, uh, you know, the paddock to to plant cabbages, which we sold on the side of a road, you know, because that was the only income we had when we were very young. And he had chooks and ducks and whatever out the back. But, yeah, he, he was inspirational, no doubt. Rob, um, you know, a little boy spending that much time and you spoke about how difficult it was for him, but gosh, it must have been hard on his mother and father as well. Imagine having your little boy and only being, and him being so unwell and only being able to go and see him once a week on a Sunday. That must have been an enormous, um, you know, thing for your mum and dad to deal with. Well, for his mum and dad, yeah, look, I suppose that was uh, just the way it was. They, they were the times and, you know, people adapted, didn't they? I mean, you're allowed one visitation a week, that was it. So you had to get on with life. So how did the polio actually affect him? What what was his disability? Uh, so he had one leg, you know, shorter than the other, you know, probably six inches a foot, just would sort of hang there, really. He had no use for that leg, so he had a caliper. Um, you know, which was a big, heavy boot, you know, with iron right up to his thigh. So he'd swing that around and walk with that. Uh, or he'd have his crutches, you know, to get around uh, or drag himself around, pull himself up and um, just found a way, you know, always found a way. Just amazing. And, um, you know, what a wonderful role model <clears throat> to set you and your family, you, you know, your siblings up for the rest of your life. It's amazing, isn't it? Sorry. <laughs> She's the producer, sorry. She does okay, get in okay. the way a little bit. No, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I, I tell you what I've always thought about. Um, just about everything I know about life or everything that inspired me about, you know, always having a go uh, was having nothing or virtually nothing growing up. Because when you didn't have it, you know, you found a way to make it, to visualise it, uh, to use your imagination. Dad used to make wooden toys for us and I can, you know, the excitement of waiting for him to unveil that wooden toy he'd made was extraordinary. And I'm not sure we have that excitement anymore because there are so many toys out there today. Uh, when I reflect back, I mean, you know, you, you got an old hunk of 
corrugated iron and bashed it out, you know, with a with a hammer and and made canoes, you know, to take down the the dam. Uh, you rode your horses across the paddock without a bridle. You you know, you jumped fences. You I, re- I remember, you know, playing footy and wanting goalposts. So I went to the Encyclopedia Britannica at school and found out. Um, you know, the height and whatever of the goalposts and then went and cut down trees in the bush, dug the holes and put rope up and pulleys and, you know, lashed them all together and made my own goalposts, which lasted about two decades, you know. So you just found a way. And I think that was that was the best education I had. So, Rob, as a little boy, did you dream of having a career in media? No, but I, I think a lot of this is in your DNA. You know, my dad had a dance band. He played the drums, uh, the Keith Bruff dance band, whatever he, he called it. And, you know, my earliest memories were going to dances on a Saturday night and sleeping next to the drum kit, you know, with, you know, mum and dad and Capalaba dances and, uh, you know, all over the place they went. And, uh, you know, the poppy on the floor and the pride of Erin and the gypsy tap. And, you know, you grew up with that. But as a little fella, you know, I would just sleep next to the drums. So music was sort of, you know, in our family. Dad played the piano accordion, the, the button accordion, mouth organ, but he just improvised, you know, he was self-taught. Um, but from a very early age, you know, I would hope that there would be some kid in the class who'd forget their lecturette so I could put my hand up and do an extra one, you know, like, well, why do you want to do that? I don't know. And, um, uh, I, I mean, we just went to a little three teachers state primary school, 100 kids, and fake day, I wanted to sing a song. You know, I'd learn a song off Dad's old wind-up gramophone. You know, you wound it up and you got three records, uh, and I'd write down the words and learn a song, and, and I, you know, put my hand up to sing a song on fake day. And yet sport was my absolute passion, you know, playing rugby league and cricket. But... Uh, yeah, uh, I went to high school, had the lead in all of the school musicals from year 8 to 12, um, was in the debating team uh, every year, uh, the drama. Uh, I, I, I think secretly was a good way of getting out of school, you know, by doing all those extracurricular things and then playing footy and cricket. I was really in the classroom and that suited me, you know, just fine. But you talk about the media, my... Nana um, used to say to me when I was in my teens, you know, Rob, you're going to work on radio and TV one day. That was the furthest thing from my mind. Like, I could not ever have imagined that happening. Um, The the only little time, um, it's funny when you connect the dots, uh, I think it was 4BH uh, that had their morning radio, Russ Walkington, I think, was, was, was the radio announcer. And they... They, they were having this um, this contest to win a pair of Barter Scout school shoes. And if you came into McQuirters in Brisbane on the school holidays and read a commercial for Barter Scout, you had the chance to win a pair of shoes. So I said to Mum, can we go and do that over the holidays? Mum's like, oh, yeah, okay, Robert, yeah, okay. Um, never thinking in her, you know, wildest dreams I'd win it. I, I didn't have a pair of shoes at that stage. But then we were on a Friday morning listening to the radio at breakfast and Russ comes on and the winner of the Barter Scout School Shoes, little Robbie Bruff from Slacks Creek, and, and here's his commercial. And we all went, up. Oh. <laughs> um, so maybe that was a bit of a you know premonition of what was going to happen down the track. That's amazing. That's amazing. So um, when you did first start in radio, you went to Charleville, mm. didn't you? So what was... That was Mum's hometown. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. She, she grew up in Charlton. So, you know, how crazy is that? Um, I've been doing radio school during my last year of high school. So I'd catch a bus into Brisbane and go to radio school, which taught you how to cue a record and, you know, read a commercial. And, and you did a tape that they would then send to the various networks. And I just had a knee operation from footy, so I was sort of laid up over Christmas 74. The floods were on. And uh, I received a letter from uh, Colour Radio 4YP at the time, and they had a network through Charleville, Longreach, Mount Isa, Brisbane, and they said, would you like a job in radio? So I was about to go to Teachers College, 
And I thought about it for about that long and said, yep, you know, um, I'm in. So I, I caught a plane to Charleville. Mm -hmm. Mum and Dad bought me a suit um, to wear. So here I am in a suit going to Charleville to work in radio. Uh, I'll never forget it. That suit had two pair of trousers. I thought, wow, this is, this is special, you know. Um, and it was mum and dad, yeah, it was mum's hometown. She, she grew up in Charleville. And I ended up living in a house just around the corner from where she grew up. Yeah. Yeah. So how old were you at that point, Rob? Uh, 18. 18. So how did you, like, because you lived in Brisbane for so long, what was it like for you going so far west? Well, we, we grew up at Slacks Creek, Daisy Hill Road, which was oh, probably about 10 k short of being late, heading towards the Gold Coast. And, and when we grew up, there was a dirt road, uh, dairy farms. You pick beans up on the hill on the weekend. Funny you tell the kids you pick beans all day to get yourself $2, you know, like. Um, so it, it was, and we lived in a little old fibro house, no um, no water on, you know, tank water. Uh, you boiled your water on the stove, had a bath, uh, no phone, TV. Not having those things was the best thing that ever happened, I think, in, in, in my younger years, you know because um, it was such an adventure. But going to Charleville, I don't know, it wasn't such a big deal. It was kind of similar to what I was used to. And you're playing footy and cricket. I mean, it, that, playing sport there was like a religion. So, you know, it wasn't easy to be a part of the community and, and I had a terrific time out there. Yeah. So then how did you make the transition from radio into television? Uh, I worked in radio for about uh, probably eight to ten years in Brisbane at 4BC, um, doing talkback radio and, and national top 40 and all that sort of thing. Went down to the Gold Coast and worked in radio there. And then there was a movie being made called Cooling Out of Gold. Michael Edgeley was the producer of that film and we got on pretty well and he hired me to work on the film um, you know, calling action on the beach, getting people motivated for all the, all the scenes, the, you know, the surf scenes and whatever. And I, I did that for them for months. And then one day he said, oh, we need someone to commentate on the movie. You know, would you like a little part? So they did some screen tests and, um, and he came to me and said, you should be working on TV. And I went, oh, I got no idea how that happens. You know, <laughs> um, funnily enough at the time, there was a still photographer I knew and he had a video camera which were brand new then. And I was in his studio one day and he said, we should set up um, you doing the news, uh, presenting sport and doing a game show. He said, we'll just do this for fun for me to test out, you know, my video camera. And isn't it crazy that in my television career, I started with sport, you know, moved into a game show and, you know, and finishing with news. Um, so we mucked around doing this video and then he was doing stills for the ABC National, which was a new news program at the time. And they saw the video being played and said, who's that? And he said, oh, you know, young guy from the Gold Coast, you know, Rob, blah, blah, blah. And they said, can we have the tape? They took it back. Two weeks later, they hired me to present the sport on the ABC National. It's amazing how things fall into place, isn't it? And, and like you've alluded to the whole way through, just those little stepping stones that that mm. led you to to the career that, that you've had, it's it's amazing. And um, so how long did you read the sport for with the ABC? I, I, was at, I was at the ABC for 12 months and then Channel 9 um, contacted me about working for them, doing the sport for them. Right. So then I went over to nine for, gee, three or four years. Had, had the most wonderful time there. Uh, you know, the birth of origin, you know, the early days of uh, state of origin. Um, you know, you had access to players. You knew the players. You know, I played footy with Wally and these sort of people, uh, you, you know, growing up. And when I was working in radio, I had the absolute pleasure to introduce the players onto the paddock at Lane Park for the first Origin game in 1980, you know, so that was just a uh, memory I'll, I'll never forget. That was just an amazing night. Mm. Um, so then working, uh, you know, at nine, doing 
what I loved covering sport, yeah, it was terrific. And then, um, so then you went and started doing Family Feud? It, it was funny because they, they rang me up one day and said, would you like to audition, you know, for this game show? And um, I, I don't even know why I thought that was appealing, but I said, yeah, okay. So I'll never forget going to the audition. We went around uh, to the Seven Studios one night. Apart from I finished reading the news online, you know, I go around to Seven, walked in. They, they'd given me uh, a game show to learn. It wasn't Family Feud. It was another show. Uh, I didn't have a video player, a video recorder, you know, to play it. So I was listening to the audio of this show when I would drive from the Gold Coast to Brisbane. So that's how I learned the show. So I learned it off word by word. I knew it. And I walk into the studio and there's all these stars of Australian TV who were clearly auditioning, you know, to host Family Feud. And I'm like, wow, there's a, there's a studio audience, lights, camera, excitement. Like it was not like the news. This was entertainment television, you know. And um, anyway, I jumped on, did the first segment, and they said, oh, that's, that's really good, thank you. And, um, you know, we'll talk later. I said, oh, I know the whole show, it's okay, I can keep going. And they go, no, 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 it's okay, we're happy with that. So I just left. And then I get a call about a week later from someone whom I didn't know, you know, in the, in the Seven Network. And he goes, you know, blah, 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 and um, we'd like you to um, come and work with us and host a new game show on the Seven Network, and we'd like to have a chat to you. And I said, uh, well, I've just had lunch. You know, I can probably slip around in about half an hour if you like. He said, uh, no, no, um, you'll need a fly down and see us. And I'm thinking, right, I don't know whether I'm going to Sydney or Melbourne. I'm, you know, like, I have no idea. But uh, sorted it out, flew down, sitting up in the, you know, some tower, you know, above Sydney, you know, looking out over the harbour. And I'll never forget them saying, you know, your life is about to change. We're going to offer you this job to host a national game show and things will never be the same. And I also clearly remember thinking to myself, no, that won't happen. Nothing's going to change. Whether you offer me this job or not or whether I take it or not, nothing's changing here. You know, like, I, um, I never bought into the star kind of thing, whatever that is, or the, uh, I, I just knew that was never going to be an issue, uh, and I suppose. Um, uh, I said yes, and, um, you know, when I'm hosted Family Feud for five years and had five terrific years, yeah, mm. wonderful years. Mm, mm. And I guess back and then, nothing Rob, changed. Yeah. Rob, um, back then, all those game shows were what reality TV is now, isn't it? Like, we have so much reality TV. Well, back then, there were so many game shows and they were just, you know, the pinnacle mm. of of, um, of someone's career, I guess, back then. Yeah, look, it, it used to, you know, blow me away just how popular the show was, you know, or, and with such a wide range of people, um, you know, you'd... You know, there would be people from the university who would tell me they had a club out at the uni where they'd all watch, you know, Family Feud. I'm thinking, are you kidding? You know, and I remember going, hosting a, a dinner one night at um, the Sheridan or somewhere and this, you know, businesswoman was sitting next to me and she said, everyone knows, you know, not to call me at, you know, five because I'm watching Family Feud. I thought she was joking, but she was serious, you know. And it, it, it just, I don't know why it was as popular as it was, but it just took off. And then we did Celebrity Family Feud on a Saturday night up against Hey Hey It's Saturday. And it was a really good time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Rob, you know, you were talking about you've, it didn't change you, the fame, and um, and that was one thing that struck – well, there were two things that struck me when I first met you was um, your humility, I guess, but also your – passion and your com compassion um, but your passion particularly for your family and um, you've had three children Jess, Sam and Tyson and um, 
I'll never forget, and I said to this to you the other day, over all these years, I have never forgotten Sam. And I have just simply because you were so passionate about talking about him and remembering him and making sure that everybody remembered him. So would you just share the story about Sam and, um, you know, your family and and how that has cemented, I guess, your compassion and, and care for other people? Well, if, if you'd asked me when I was 17 or 18, you know, what did you want out of life? Uh, and I said this to people, um, I just want a little boy. Um, um, uh, yeah. Uh, I just want a little boy I can kick the 40 around with. And um, maybe it was because, um, funny, I catch her after all these years. So, um, you know, maybe it was because, you know, Dan couldn't kick the 40 around. You know, he couldn't run around. You know, not that he didn't engage in everything, but he was incredible. Um, took me to 40, took me to cricket, took me anywhere I wanted to go. We, you know, it was so engaged, but we, we couldn't run around together. So, I remember thinking, you know, just, you know, son, to, uh, you know, keep the footy around with would be everything. Um, and, and, you know, and have a little boy, Sammy. And, um, and we would do that. Um, and, and had a daughter, Jess. Um, and, and, and he was everything, you know, that she wanted out of a little boy. I mean, we would, Go to bed at night, and it would be like you'd have to say good night to you know the football, the boxing gloves, the cricket bat, you know all those things. Um, and he was my mate. And on his third birthday, we lost him with asthma, and um, yeah, for the first time in my life, I think the one thing I struck me was uh, you can't do anything, you know, like you you know you're, you're helpless. Um, every other time you could find a way um, you could work harder you could try harder you could you, you, you know you, you, you could you had control over fixing something or doing something better but this was fine uh, that was really hard to deal with there was nothing I could do to change what had happened um, but I had to get over, well, we had to understand that, you know, quickly that uh, you can't change it, so don't dwell on it in the sense that don't ask why or how or could something have been done differently or because none of that is going to matter. So that was the lesson I learned from that, you know. Um, we had our young daughter, Jess, who was five and um, it was so important to, you know, be the best dad you could for her, you know. Um, but it, it, it was, um, and it's, you know, it was just an extraordinary time to try to understand how to deal with all of that. So, you know, for me, he became an inspiration, um, it, you know, and, and you're right, I used to fear that people would not know that Sam, this little boy, had a life, you know. Um, who, who was Sam? What? What impact did he have, or would he just be forgotten? So, you know, that was the thing to whenever I got a chance to talk about him, because he was part of me. Then uh, everything I did, he was, he was, uh, you know, he, he was inspiration. So, um, as I've gone on and I've coached football teams and I've engaged in different people, and I sort of figured you didn't know me unless you knew Sam, you know, so. Um, yeah, and then Tyson was born, um, you know, a year or so later, which, you know, Tyson's my best mate, you know, and um, he's 32 today. <laughs> so, um, so, so lucky to have had another little boy, you know, and, um, and, and crazily, the relationship Tyson has with the brother he never knew is extraordinary. You know, I can't explain that. 
So um, I did read that Tyson is very connected to Sam. So how can you just explain a little bit about that relationship that they have? And well, clearly, you know, Tyson grew up knowing about Sam, knowing about you know the brother he never, he never was able to share anything with, but knew about him. You know, we talked about him. His photo, his photos were everywhere, um, and. And I, I don't know how these connections work, but, you know, he had such a powerful connection with Sam uh, throughout his entire life. Um, and, you know, even now, he, you know, if he's going down the Gold Coast, he, he'll drop into where Sam's grave is and sit and talk to him, uh, you know, now in his 30s, you know. Um, quite powerful. Uh, the uh, he, he will get upset about you know Sam on different anniversaries. Um, so yeah, and I, and I don't need to understand you know the why of that. That's just how it is, and it's lovely. You know, um, there's a lot of instances, but I I struggle to tell you. But um, yeah, it's it's just a powerful thing. Yeah, Rob. Um I lost my mum when I was quite young and I often think back to how difficult it must have been for her knowing that she was going to pass away, leaving two little girls behind. But I think that one of the, the worst thing that can happen to anybody in their life is to lose their child. Um, but getting back to my mum, I've had... Um, experiences where I felt her so her presence so strongly in my life that I don't ever question that you know there's there's more to life because I have felt her right beside me and um, you know look what Sam has brought you and look what um, the I was thinking this morning you know I remember so the the one thing that I remember you most strongly about is how passionate you were about Sam and you have to know about Sam. And and I wonder how many other people you've impacted in that way and how many other people out there remember Sam after 20 or 30 years or, um, you know, it's such a great gift that you have given him and, um, and that you give other people too because you... Uh, yeah, you just show people that pe that even though you lose someone, you don't forget them, and um, and and they do. Yeah, look, I things. think everyone has a different way of dealing with that. Um, yeah, uh, and and people are unsure how to deal with it as well. Um, you know, because they're worried sometimes about what others will think. Um, do you display photographs? Do you talk about it, or is it uncomfortable for others if you do that? Um, you know, the, the number of letters, you know, we had for years about, you know, people saying, oh, that was so good to hear that you, you know, had dealt with your loss in that way because we felt we could then, you know, uh, put up photographs of our little boy or little girl. Um, because, you know, no one, no one prepares you for these sort of things, you know. And, and nor do you want to be prepared. And, you know, you, you don't wish anyone to uh, go through losing a child, um, but it happens. Uh, and, and then we can often just be left, you know, in this void of not knowing how to deal with it, um, worrying about what's appropriate. We shouldn't. It's what's appropriate for you, you know. If, you do whatever you want to do. Um, but um, look, I, I, I guess the one thing I'm really aware of and I stayed aware of is that, you know, everyone has their life to go on with and, and we will feel for someone and we will be and, and we'll empathise, you know, with them and, and we genuinely care about them, but then we have our own life. So we will, you know, go on being involved in our own families or whatever, 
but they're still dealing with that. You know, they are still dealing with the anniversaries. You know, they're still dealing with the Christmases where they'd love to be buying their child that present, and they and they're watching other parents, you know, prepare for Christmas. And that's a tough time of the year, you know. And um, I remember thinking, um, you know, in the early days when it's really tough, you know, the early Christmases we didn't have him. And, you know, you're walking down the aisle with everyone going about their business. You want to scream, you know, you know, I don't have my son, you know, because it's hurting you. Then I used to think, how many people am I passing who are dealing with the same thing? And I don't know. Um, and they may respond in a different way. And they may, um, you know, be doing it really tough, but we don't know, you know. You don't know unless you're walking in their shoes, you have no idea. So I suppose it made me more understanding of how people may be responding or reacting or because we don't know what the heck's going on in their life. And <clears throat> when you know someone has lost someone or something like that, just now and again, little call, how you're travelling, you know, mm. how things going, or just letting them know you haven't forgotten yeah. is a lovely thing, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Rob, I have a friend whose um, oldest daughter is the same age as my daughter and our neighbour's daughter and they, Ange and Amy, my daughter and our neighbour, um, they went through distance ed together and, and um, anyway, Nina, our other friend, she her little girl had Angelman, has Angelman syndrome. And Nina said to me once, I look at Ange and Amy and I think that's what, what Ivy should be doing now. That's where she should be at. And I, it struck me how heartbreaking it must be for Nina to see our girls um, doing what they're doing, completing school, going to uni and being independent um, and how difficult. It just must be so hard. Um, so it, it's good to look at uh, things from from somebody else's point of view and try to look through their eyes and and you're right, it's all about understanding and isn't it? And and having that compassion. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll never forget Wayne Bennett saying to me, you know, why not me? He was one of the first people I spoke to uh, because on the Friday before Wayne and I had been chatting about our sons, you know, and he had, you know, difficulties with his son, of course, as we know. And, um, and we've just been talking about issues and how we were dealing with them out at the Broncos. Um, after I'd interviewed him on a Friday and then on the Monday, you know, I was calling him to say we'd lost Sam. And, you know, I'll never forget him saying, you know, why not us? Why not me? Because, you know, we're not immune from anything. Um, and, and it's like, to be honest, I'm a bit fragile at the moment uh, because their daughter's just had, you know, she's going through breast cancer. So and she has two, sorry, two little girls and a boy. So they live with us. We all live together uh, with her husband, which is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. But uh, now we're going down that journey, which is, uh, you know, a different one again. She's, uh, you know, just had the surgery and all the chemo for five months and then starting that journey again. And, um, yeah, it, it just throws up a whole lot of different scenarios, you know. And you're right, you're talking about your mum now. I'm watching my daughter as a mum. Look at her, you know, three young children and wonder what the future is going to be and, you know, where we're heading with all of that. So, um, yeah, um, life's journey is what it is, hey? That's right. Um, it's not... It's not easy and, oh, gosh, I mean, there's so much that can be done now and, and it's, it, there's a lot, a lot more treatments and so I just hope and pray for your family that it all, um, you know, passes and, and everybody's happy and that's, I yeah. feel for you, I really do, I just... No, 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 and I'm not after sympathy, so no, I didn't bring it up no. for that reason, yeah. I'm just 
you know, you, you, you don't realise sometimes, you know, how things are affecting you until you start, you know, talking about different issues. But I find um, what, what, what we've found now is really important more than ever, you know, to get something out of the day, to be really, you know, positive about enjoying the moment. And I know we always talk about this, but um, more than ever, it's so important to uh, embrace the day and the moment because I've got an old saying, you know, tomorrow never comes. You know, tomorrow becomes today, you know. So enjoy today the best you can and um, see something good in the day and, you know, find something that, um, you know, as a family you can enjoy. I love, you know, the grandkids running around and, you know, being in our life and seeing the daughter every day and, you know, being a part of this journey with her, uh, being able to talk to her about it. Um, it yeah, it's, um, it's a fair challenge. But how blessed is she to have, have you know, such a wonderful and so much strength in, in her life behind her, you know, cheering her on and, um, and what a special thing that they all live with you. I, I think that's just amazing. And we were just talking about it recently because, um, well, Lily's at boarding school. She's our youngest and she'll be home next year for a year. But our other two older, Hutton and Amy, are both at home with us. And um, we just love it. And actually, it was only yesterday I was joking and saying, I'm going to build one other house just on the corner there and one there. So when you two get married and one of you can live with us in this house. So we're all still together because, um, yeah, it's just so special. And I love, I love having, having them around and it's not always smooth sailing. We all get on each other's nerves occasionally, but you know, at the end of the day, we just, it's just, special and I love that they want to be here with us so you know how blessed are we Rob oh yeah it's yeah no it's it's um and it's funny because um they'll have grandfather's day at school or whatever or grandparents day and you know they'll say so it's your dad it's your granddad coming up oh, no that's Rob it's not my granddad that's Rob <laughs> Uh, and it's so funny because they grew up, because Tyson's always called me Rob because I've coached him at footy, you know, for, well, like, you know, for whatever, since he was, you know, another sevens all the way through and he didn't want to be calling me dad, so it was always Rob. And then the grandkids cotton on to it and then one of them called me Robbie one day and I've never been called Robbie. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it's Rob or Robbie, but it's kind of funny. They think it's funny now, you know, as they've gotten a little bit old, six, eight and 12, and they understand it. They know, no, 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 he's not Poppy, he's, he's Rob, you know. So, yeah, they're my best mates. They're terrific. Yeah, that, that's so funny. Rob, um, I want to ask you about footy. Now, I don't know much about football. I'm not really a football fan, but um, you are really passionate and you coach the Kiwana Dolphins. Yeah, look, I've, I've been lucky to be involved in football for a lot of years. Uh, that, that was my, my gramps. That was his influence because, you know, I didn't grow up knowing anything about it uh, until I went to his place one day and he had a book in his um, little cupboard there called This Is Rugby League and I got it out and read it and read it and reread it and reread it and fell in love with the game. And He had played footy and, you know, he'd take me to Lane Park to watch the games in the early years and, um, again, it's, I don't know, it's just part of your DNA, you know, it just seems to... Just part of our life, you know, uh, massively part of our life. Uh, I've coached women, you know, for 12 years. Uh, I coached Souths in Brisbane, uh, had 11 seasons with them, uh, coaching over eight women. Yeah, I've been head coach of Kiwana Dolphins for many years and coach kids and I'm back coaching women again at Kiwana now. And yeah, I love the game, but love the people more mm. than anything. Just love the people. Mm. Mm. My, um, husband and son just love rugby and um you know they well Hutton played at school but Barry played at school too and they both um you mentioned about cricket before and they both um play cricket which it's really lovely because when Barry has played for years and years for the our local um 
team. He go, we, he drives two hours into town um, when, in cricket season to play um, play cricket. And now, and you know, Hutton used to go along as a little boy and watch him. And now, you know, they've been playing in the same team together and sport just brings families together doesn't it and um you know particularly that father-son relationship and you mentioned you've coached Tyson and and how you know it's just so so lovely and and I love watching Hutton and Barry together and you know they're bowling together or whatever it's just really lovely yeah it's um I mean it's crazy how you know, sport, you know, brings people together. You meet people from all different walks of life. Um, you know, you understand, you know, their backgrounds and, you know, when you coach them, you know, you you get to care about, you know, care about them as people, not just footy players, you know. So you end up with this big family of people you sort of get to know. And it's funny, some of the boys I coached in sevens and eights, uh, you know, they're – they now have children who are seven or eight, you know. Um, th- there are some boys who I can vividly remember running across the field, you know, running late with their headgear flapping and, uh, you know, I'm coming, Rob, I'm coming, you know. And and now I've coached them in A grade, you know. We've won premierships together as, you know, as mature age men and uh, and now they have little boys, you know, families of their own and they're, and they're coaching their own kids, you know. And those journeys are so special. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's amazing, isn't it, how life goes by so quickly and, and, and our kids grow up and then they have kids of their own and then you're watching all of this and I, mm. yeah, I often sit back and think, gosh, you know, um, it wasn't so long ago that that was us, and and grandmothers, are, grandparents are getting younger, look younger, don't they, than than what they did when we were little. <laughs> but, yeah, well, yeah. the f- family gatherings you always had a game around us, didn't you? I mean, that, that's my memory of you know Nana and everyone playing and getting out and having a bat, you know, and, uh, you know, big families, you know. Playing, you know, and you'd love that when your cousins and everyone would come down and you'd be out of the game of cricket. And, uh, it was pretty special, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Rob, um, so you, you talk about your coaching and what are the some of the keys to success that have led you to success and and what you impart to the people that you coach? What are some of the things that you teach? Look, I think preparation is the key to everything. Um, preparation will help you go past talent, um, effort, attitude, desire. Uh, they can just be words, but when you put a meaning behind them and, and, and live them, uh, then they make a difference. Um, I always figured that you know, if you understood and you were really prepared in what you were doing, you gave yourself a chance against those who were naturally more talented. And and I found that in sport, you know, when I was growing up, for some reason I used to go and want to find out uh, how you did things, you know, um, how you trained, you know, for the 800 and the 400 at school. And uh, I'd go to the library and, there wasn't very much information around that I was searching for. I just wanted to know a better way, you know. I guess I wanted to always understand how you could give yourself the best chance. Um, and preparation for me was one of those key areas. If you were prepared the best you, you possibly could be in what you were doing, then you were giving you the best chance, given, you know, the talent you brought to the game, the talent, you know, you brought to the stage, whatever it was. Um, and I think that work ethic, you know, from dad, no doubt, never giving up um, because um, there was no quit in him ever. Um, and I understood that, you know, from a very early age. So I, I think that's probably been the most powerful thing, you know, um, find a way, you know, like, Sometimes you think you've 
you backed into a corner or you, you think that's the end of the road, but look for another track, look for another avenue and talk to people who know more about it than you do. That's one of the things I figured out very early. You'd always hear people talking about experience. Oh, but you need experience. And I'm thinking, well, I don't have 10 years to sit here, you know, getting experience. How else do I get it? So I thought, well, you get it from people who have experience. Go and talk to them. How do they do it? Why do they do it? What were the mistakes they made? So I figured you could, in, instead of this 10-year experience you needed, you could squeeze that back, you know, to six months or whatever by talking to people who had already been there and done it. So I always sought out people who knew more about it than I did and read books, read everything I could. didn't have to be about football. could have been about, you know, hockey or basketball or whatever. But if you'd been successful, I wanted to know why you'd been successful. What was your formula? Um, I read a lot of Vince Lombardi, who was coach of the Green Bay Packers back in the 50s, 60s, read everything about him. And I think the principles, you know, that he had back then of, um, you know, being prepared and, and absolutely giving the best you have and, and, and always getting up and having another go, you know, those principles remain. The way, you know, the, the, the knowledge we have now, the science we have behind sport and whatever, of course that's changed. But those principles have never changed. And I think that's, that's been the key, you know. Just find a way. Don't, don't accept no, you know. Um, yeah, just, just keep having a go. And when, when I coach, I always sort of talk about trying to find your best, but we'll never find it because we don't know what it is. I mean, it's an indefinable thing. Uh, you might think this is your best now. But you, you train an extra couple of hours a week or train smarter or find a different technique and you're going to be better again. So now that's your best. But is there another level? Is there another level? You know, we're always chasing our best, I think, and never being satisfied with where you are. You know, I, I mean, that's just my journey. I'm not saying for a moment that has to be everyone else's journey. That's, they're just my thoughts. Rob, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to make contact with you again, but also to chat with you and, and, and give me your insight. I um, have admired you from afar all over these years and I've never forgotten you and I've never forgotten Sam. And um, I've always been struck by your compassion and your humility. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with me today. Hi Kelly, I appreciate it, really enjoyed it, thank you. Thank you for watching and listening to my interview. If you'd like to hear more inspiring stories, subscribe to my YouTube channel or my podcast and follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Life Journey TV.